सहनावतु सहनौ भुनक् सह वीर करवाह तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु मिद्विषावह ओ शातिशाशा हरि ओ तत्स I could hear that you are doing the Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. It was composed by Shankaracharya some fourteen hundred years ago, and I don't know whether it was entirely coincidental that you are doing that, but it's absolutely relevant to what we are going to start discussing right now. Um, it's going to be very helpful. The first verse itself, Mano Buddhaankara Chittani Naham, Nacha Shrotra Jivasya Nacha Ghana Nacha Netre. न च व्योम भूमि न तेजो न वायु चिदानंद रूप शिवोहम शिवोहम इट मीन्स आई एम नॉट द माइंड आई एम नॉट द इंटेलेक्ट आई एम नॉट द मेमोरी आई एम नॉट इवन द ईगो सेंस द आई द वन विच इज सेइंग आई आई एम नॉट इवन दैट आई एम नॉट द फाइव सेंस ऑर्गन्स आई एम नॉट दिस मेटीरियल बॉडी मेड ऑफ द फाइव एलिमेंट्स अर्थ वाटर फायर एयर और स्पेस then what am i i am existence consciousness bliss absolute i am shiva consciousness and bliss absolute chidananda roopa shivoham shivoham now in the light of what we were discussing do you see how he is shifting the i i am not the body i am not the mind but i am existence consciousness bliss this is shifting the i this shifting the reference of the i reference word bottle referent this one this thing the famous um, philosopher wittgenstein when in in uh, when he was teaching in cambridge one day in order to drive home the point of the difference between a word and its referent he held up a piece of chalk and he asked his students in cambridge university what's this and they said why a chalk and he threw it at the student and it hit him and he said chalk is a word was that a word <laughs> so the word and a thing are different so the what does the word i stand for when you say what does the word bottle stand for you can show me what does the word i stand for normally we would say i means i am this and you're shifting the meaning of the i the meaning of the i which we feel is this vedanta is beginning to shift it now we will understand what shankaracharya meant how do you shift it how do you say i am not the mind how do you say i am not the body how let's see that's what our journey is going to be yama tells nachiketa after giving him all the advice on preparation for spiritual life yama tells nachiketa indriye bhyo para yartha arthe bhyascha param mana manasastu para buddhi buddhe ratma mahan para mahatah param abhyaktam अव्यक्ता पुष पर पुषा न पर किंचि साकाष्ठा सा परा गति सेज सेंस ऑब्जेक्ट्स आर हायर देन द सेंसेज माइंड इज हायर देन द सेंस ऑब्जेक्ट्स इंटेलेक्ट इज हायर देन द माइंड एंड द महान आत्मा ग्रेट सोल इज हायर देन द इंटेलेक्ट बियॉन्ड दैट द अनमैनिफेस्टेड इज हायर देन द महत purusha is higher than the unmanifested and there is nothing higher than the purusha that is the culmination the highest goal now all this may sound intimidating we'll take a slightly different track we'll do exactly what yama is uh, telling nachiketa but a slightly easier uh, track which is found in the taittiriya upanishad this is a katha upanishad in taittiriya upanishad the same thing is done uh, exactly the same thing the inner journey and the inner journey refers to what we have already found out what we have already come across the body the sense organs the mind the intellect and the passenger sitting in the in the back how do you distinguish the passenger from the rest of it that's the, the that's the task before us and we will do that for this you need to follow carefully because we are moving step by step it and if you miss a step or if you take a misstep then you'll be lost you will certainly find the rest of us have disappeared you are standing alone somewhere <laughs> so you have to follow this carefully in the taittiriya upanishad 
we find what is what is called the pancha kosha vichara an inquiry into the five sheets of the human personality an inquiry into the five sheets of the human personality that's what we will undertake remember now we are at the top of the ladder beginning base is karma yoga purification of mind bhakti yoga and meditation concentration of mind the top of the ladder is knowledge about ourselves enlightenment knowledge how does it come about through inquiry what inquiry now we start the inquiry into the five sheets of the human personality so from the taittiriya upanishad we see first let's take this physical body a teacher i was in a teacher training college so we would always tell the trainee teachers where to be a good teacher you need to start where the student is you need to start where the student is good teacher takes you from the known to the unknown from what is near to what is far and from what is to what shall be so near to the um, far from the known to the unknown from what is to what shall be so that's the golden rule of teaching and the upanishad does that if you say you are existence consciousness bliss it sounds nice but doesn't mean anything what does it refer to we are trying to find out the real reference of the word i we are trying to find out the real reference of the word i just as the word bottle clearly means this thing right now the word i means this thing why is it wrong and what is the real thing it, it should refer to that's what we are trying to do in this inquiry let's see when we say i means this thing the upanishad calls it the food sheath annamaya kosha the food sheath you can write it down if you want to write in english the food sheath sheath is something that covers the food sheath the annamaya the physical body is the food sheath why the food sheath because it's a transformation of food all the pizza you ate where is it it's me now it's not pizza anymore it's me i have referred to this hollywood actress who was asked long time back who was asked about the secret of her beauty and she said oh this it's all pasta she was italian so the physical beauty she is all pasta secret of beauty is pa- pasta means that's what has been transformed into the body so um a british scientist recently referred to the body as he says what are we he says body what are we we are food rearranged it's arranged on your plate you rearrange it it becomes the body <laughs> so the upanishad calls it the food sheath am i this food sheath i seem to be i seem to be the upanishad says no you are not why not let's see for a number of reasons one primary reason is the body remember the body as it was when you were 10 years old or 15 or 5 years old and the body as it is now it's a huge difference a person may not recognize that it's the same person body as uh, as it was when we were teenagers or when or if somebody is a teenager i will say just wait <laughs> just wait yes no hurry about it but it it'll happen to everybody there's this story about a jewish rabbi who came to his congregation a young person very young person and somebody in the congregation complained to the chief rabbi he's too young to be a rabbi and people have told me that you're too young to be a, a, a monk or something he's too young to be a rabbi and the chief rabbi wrote back very interestingly he wrote back it is true that youth is a defect but one that is eminently curable by time give it time <laughs> he'll soon be old don't worry so the body which is which was a toddler which is a young child which was a teenager which was a young man or woman which was a middle aged body which is now an old body such a difference an enormous difference we see and yet we say i am that i was that little child playing i am this person who is middle aged or old sitting here i am that person if i seem to be a unity i don't say the child was different and i am different i am one and yet this body has changed so much i don't feel that i have changed all the change i feel is in the body one uh, rather elderly lady said i get shocked when i look at the mirror and i feel that it's, it's where did all those years go i said who is this person in the mirror she's so old 
And she, <laughs> and one of the nuns was saying it in, in California. So it, it happens that suddenly you find the body has changed. The body changes. We feel we are the same person who we were. We feel we are one. We don't feel we have parts. The body has parts. Body is a, is a composite. You know, not only hands and feet, but so many tissues and organs. It's, it's a um, compound and enormously sophisticated and complex machine. We don't feel we are parts. We feel like a unity. I am one. The body is a multiplicity. How can I be both a complex thing and a unity at the same time? Right? Continuously changing thing and yet unchanging at the same time. And deeper reason, more serious reason is, I feel this body, I see this body, I can feel it, I can smell it, I can touch it, I can, I can hear it. it it's an, just a, like an object. Just as this object is subject to all my, uh, I can experience it with my five senses, I can fully experience and we do experience the body all the time. It's an object of knowledge for us. We are the knower. I am the subject, my body is an object. How is it different from other objects? Only because I get internal sensations from it, because of my nervous system. If my nervous system does not function, a person who is, one hand is paralyzed, the paralyzed hand is just like an object. No feedback from it. So, the object is always different from the subject. The body is changing continuously, I don't feel that I am changing, because all the change I feel is in the body. You say, no, Ma Swami, I've changed a lot in the last 50 years, but where are those changes? You'll find, if you look at right, to look at the changes, the changes are all in the body or the mind. You have not changed. If you had changed, you would have said, that was a different person, I'm a different person. That was an entirely different person. I'm an entirely different person. That was 20 years ago, somebody else, that's not somebody else. When we mean that, when, whenever we say, I am a different person, we mean it figuratively. We don't mean it literally. We don't mean that I have to change my uh, driver uh, you know, uh, identity card or my passport because I'm a different person. That's a quick way to get committed. <laughs> no, we all, when we say we, are, we have changed, we mean it figuratively. The changes are always in the body or in the mind. So, and deeper reason, because always the body is presented to us and as an object of knowledge. In the Gita, Krishna tells Arjuna in the 13th chapter, this body is the field and you are the knower of the field. Kshetra and Kshetrakya. That which you know is the field of your knowledge and you are the knower of the field. Now the entire universe is the field of your knowledge. Everything here is the field of your knowledge. Why the body? Because, what Krishna means is, with the entire world out there, I don't feel identified. I don't feel I am a microphone or, or a podium or I don't feel that I am you or him or her. I don't feel that. They are, they are objects of experience for me. I see them, I hear them, I interact with them. But they are different from me. I'm quite clear about it. They are all objects. I am the knowing subject. But the problem starts with the skin. The moment you come to the skin and within it, we behave in a strange way. We sometimes say, I am a man, or I am thin, or I am overweight, clearly referring to the body and saying, I am. Uh, so if you say, I am 200 pounds, how can you, the subject consciousness, be 200 pounds? How can pure consciousness be 200 pounds? How can the witness be 200 pounds? It's the body which is 200 pounds, but yet we say, I am 200 pounds. And sometimes we behave as if it, it were a possession. My shirt, my arm, my body, as if it's mine, but it's not me. We speak in both ways. Sometimes we refer to it as an object, sometimes we refer to it as ourselves. So the confusion starts with the body. That, is it us or not? Sometimes we speak of it as, it, as if it, that's what I am. I am the body and the body is me. Somebody said, it's like, when you say that this body is me, you are mistaking iron for gold. And when you say, I am the body, you're mistaking gold for iron. You are gold, in the sense of being very valuable, precious. And the body is not so. But when you say, I am the body, you're forgetting that you are the gold and you think this iron is you. And when you say the other way around, the body is me. 
You've forgotten the your real nature and you're saying, I am material, I am not spirit. So this is what is happening. Because the body is an object, because the body is subject to change, because the body is a composite of many parts, because I feel that I am the subject all the time, I feel I am a unity, not a composite. I feel that I am not changing, the body is changing. Otherwise, why would I say, when I look at the mirror, who's that? I don't feel any different, but this body is so different. When I say because of these reasons, and there are many other reasons also, because of these reasons, the food sheath is not me. I am somehow associated with it, no doubt about it, but it's not me. No more than the shirt is me or the car in which I sit is me. It's not me. The chariot upon which you ride, Yama tells Nachiketa, you are the passenger, obviously. Well, not, not obviously. The way you behave is as if you were that chariot. You are not the chariot. You are, not, you are something apart from the chariot. You are the passenger. Here you are the witness, the subject, the body is an object. Let's go deeper. Inside the body, throughout the body, we feel. What do we feel? All kinds of feelings. Energy, weakness, surging of nerve currents, feelings throughout the body. This body is pervaded by life. So this life sheath, it's called pranamaya kosha, the deeper, subtler. Subtler than this body, interior to the body. Interior means pratyak, the Sanskrit word is pratyak, interior. And sukshma, subtler. The body is thula, gross. Subtler than the body is the life sheath. What is the life sheath? It's not a physical thing which you can see. It's not a physical thing. It is physical, but not in a gross sense. But you can feel it. When you feel hungry, it's a life sheet. When you feel satiated, it's that life sheet, pranamaya kosha. When you breathe in and out, it's the life sheet. When, when you feel, you know, heart is beating, you're sweating, and all these physiological functions are going on. Food is being assimilated. We, even if, Some things we feel, some things we do not feel. Some things are voluntary, some things are autonomous, it's going on. This is the life sheet, pranamaya kosha. Health, sickness, more related to the pranamaya kosha than to the physical body. In Ayurveda, for example, they treat the prana more than the physical body. When you do Tai Chi, today you're doing some of you, yoga. Yoga deals with prana, pranayama. Tai Chi, do you know what the word chi means? Energy, prana. Exactly that, life forces, prana. They deal with the life forces, not with the physical body itself through the physical body. So that is subtler than the physical body, inert to it. Subtler, sukshma. Inner, pratyak. So am I the life sheath? I am not the physical, bo physical body. Physical body is a kosha, a covering, a sheath. The reality is within. What is the reality? The life. So am I the life sheath? Again, the same objects, ap objections apply. It is changing all the time. Sometimes I'm hungry, sometimes I'm satiated, sometimes I feel strong and energetic, sometimes I feel weak, I feel sick. The life sheet is changing all the time. Sometimes I'm breathing heavily, sometimes serenely. The life sheet is constantly in change. Breathing in and out. And I am the one which does not change. I am the one who felt sick. I am the one who feels healthy. I am the one who felt hungry. I am the one who feels satiated. I am the same one. And all these things have changed. Hence, I cannot be the life sheet. It's changing, I am unchanging. Remember, all these things are not only for understanding, but also for feeling. When, what, when they are saying this, they are pointing out to something in our experience. When? Not when you become very spiritual. It's right now. They are taking us hand in, in the, by the hand and leading us in that inner journey. Deeper and deeper and deeper. Subtler and subtler and subtler. More sukshma, subtler. More pratyak, inner. The life sheet. I am not that. Because it changes, I do not feel I change in relation to it. Because, even deeper, I am the knower of the life sheet and life sheet is an object. As much as this body is an object, as much as this bottle is an object, the functions of my life sheet are also an object of knowledge for me. I can't point it out physically, but I can feel it. I know it. Every time I breathe in and breathe out, I know it. I know it. It's an object. 
If it's an object, I am the knower of the object. The knower and the known cannot be the same. The subject and the object are different. As I am different from this bottle, I am also different from this life sheet, no matter how subtle. The pranamaya is different and the knower is different. The passenger of the vehicle is different and the engine which is providing the energy is different from the passenger. It's different. Though we are associated with it and we depend upon it, we couldn't do anything without it. Deeper than this. Let's go deeper. It's an object. I am something subject. I know, I'm knowing it from inside. Let's go inside. Deeper. Pratyak. Deeper. Sukshma. Subtler. Subtler than the life sheet. Inner to the life sheet is the mental sheet. Mind. And this is where most people today will stop. Who am I? I'm the mind. I am my thoughts. Look at the paradox in the language. I never say I am my shirt. I am my dog. No. I am my thoughts. Same language. I am my thoughts. That's what we feel all the time. Happy thoughts, I am happy. Not that my thoughts are happy. Sad thoughts, I am sad. Not that my thoughts are sad. I am my thoughts. That's what we feel. And yet the same objections apply here. Thoughts come and go. Much faster. The changes in the mind sheet are faster than the changes in the, white, in the life sheet. The life sheet changes are faster than the changes in the gross sheet. In the, in the physical food sheet. Mind is changing continuously. Somebody said we have 16,000 or some thoughts or something in a day, in a waking day. Not different thoughts, many of the thoughts are repeated. But anyway, thousands of thoughts, they come and go. I do not come and go. I am the same. So the thoughts come and go. Feelings come and go. Memories come and go. I am the same. I am the one who is having those thoughts. Feelings, memories. The second reason, I am the knower and the thoughts are the known. Do you know your own thoughts? What do you mean by that, Swami? Are you aware of your own thoughts? Of course. Who else will be aware of my thoughts if not me? You may be a telepath. You'll have to be a telepath to be aware of my thoughts. But I am always aware of my thoughts. Sometimes I may not pay attention. Paying attention to your own thoughts is called introspection. Looking in. But even when we're look, not looking in, don't we say, I am happy, I am satisfied. What, what, you, what do you say when you say, when, what do you mean when you say I am happy, I am satisfied? You are reporting an internal state. You are reporting an inter internal state which means you are aware of it. If you look in and try to study your state, it's called introspection. But even without introspecting, we are aware of our own thoughts. They arise in our consciousness. If I am aware of my thoughts, I am the subject and the thoughts become as much of an object as this bottle. It's just that they are, aware, they are very subtle and they are close to me. They are internal to me. But I am something deeper than the thoughts. I am something unchanging, the thoughts are changing. I am the knower, the thoughts are the known. I am the subject, the thoughts are an object. Hence, I cannot be the mind sheath. And here starts the magic of Vedanta. If I am not the mind sheath, then I am not those thoughts, they are not me and I do, they do not belong to me also. They arise in me, in the field of awareness which I call myself, which I call, say, I. I am aware of them, but they are not me as much as this bottle is not me. They are an object. The example which I give is a person who goes to the Swami in the Himalayas and says, I often give this example. They say it there. Um, I am miserable. I am very I am miserable. And the Swami says, do you feel your misery? Of course, I feel my misery. I'm, that's why I'm saying I'm miserable. That's why I've come. If I didn't feel misery, why would I say I'm miserable? If you feel your misery, you know your misery, then you are the knower of the misery, and the misery is the known object. You are the subject, the misery is the object. Subject and object are always different. Then the misery is an object of your knowledge. You are not miserable. If you know the misery, you are the knower of the misery in your mind. I'm not denying there is misery in the mind. No more than I would deny that there is a spot on your shirt. The spot on the shirt, you are the knower of the spot on your shirt. You are not the spot on your shirt. You are not the miserable thought, the negative thought in your mind. Let it be there. Let it be happy. <laughs> the miserable thought. Swami Vivekananda used to tell the story of a big bull. And a mosquito came and sat on the horn of the bull. 
after some time the mosquito felt a little bad you know it was sitting without encroaching without permission and said mr bull mr bull and bull said where is this voice coming from i'm here on your horn and uh, i sat here i didn't ask your permission i'm sorry i hope i didn't cause any trouble to you oh not at all you see the bull like that the big one oh not at all I, it's no problem i wasn't, wasn't even aware you are there you can bring your whole family and settle down there your attitude to negative thoughts will be like that thoughts which were so long making you miserable and depressed and all let it come and go what is it to you you are the field of awareness on in which the thoughts shine a ray of like we have seen all this uh, always you know in the morning a ray of sunlight coming through the lattices in the window and the motes of dust which pass through that ray we can see them the brownian movement of the motes of dust the light is not at all affected by the motes of dust those little bits of dust which come fly in the light rather the the dust depends on the light for illumination you become aware of it because of the light light is not at all affected by the dust similarly let thoughts come let thought let thoughts go i am not affected i am not miserable because when the thoughts are mis- uh, miserable thoughts arise or they go away when you think like that your mind becomes calm and this person when he was told this he became calm and he went to the swami and he said yes swami you are right i am very peaceful now and the swami scolded him there's a real thing the swami scolded him and saying no you are the knower of the peaceful thoughts in your mind you are not peaceful you see what's the logic behind it what, what what's important about this you see what's important is this he had fallen into a trap when the mind is miserable identified with it i am miserable when you disidentify with it the mind will gen- generally become calm you see the mind does not want to torment us we torment the mind with trash from the world what we see what people are talking about us you know i've seen two things interest us if somebody is praising us we are interested in listening to what they say or she is saying and even more so if somebody is criticizing us it will hurt we will not forgive that person but still we want to know we are torturing the mind by putting this trash in the mind the mind doesn't want to disturb us the pure mind will lead us straight to god to its real home to god is the mind which we have perverted and tortured for years that is putting us in trouble in trouble so when the mind becomes calm we again become attached to it and we say i am so calm now trap nature of the mind is to change within 2 minutes within 20 minutes when it's out on the freeway when it's back from the himalayas into mumbai or delhi the mind will change and will say oh i was so peaceful in the himalayas or in the vedanta society now i am miserable again don't get attached to the misery of the mind or the happiness of the mind or the peace of the mind thus you attain real peace that which you are the upanishad has a name for you the upanishad has a name for you the name is shantam in the mandukya upanishad we find name of the self is shantam shivam advaitam shantam peace itself you are peace itself not a peaceful state not a peaceful state mind goes through peaceful states and disturbed states and it will go through it don't worry about it so you are not the mind sheet beyond the mind sheet we find the sheet of the intellect if you are not the mind sheet deeper than the mind sheet is the sheet of the intellect sheet of the mind is called manomaya kosha manomaya kosha manas is sanskrit word for mind deeper than the mind sheet is vigyana maya kosha the sheet of the intellect sheet of the intellect what is that that's it's very important to follow them and feel exa- feel it also because they are pointing out to something which is within our experience now what is the sheet of the intellect exactly what we are all using i hope to understand <laughs> what we are using now trying to understand what this guy is saying we are using the intellect that's the intellectual sheet how is it different from the mind sheet the mind sheet is feelings memories in sanskrit they say sankalpa vikalpa thoughts options coming and going but when you have knowledge 2 plus 2 is 4 i am swami so and so this kind of knowledge this is the intellect sheet of the intellect it's basically the same thing the functions are different deeper than the mind sheet is the sheet of the intellect 
इट इज इनर इट इज सटलर प्रत्यक इनर सटलर सूक्ष्म सटलर देन द माइंड शीत इज द विज्ञान मय कोश द शीत ऑफ द इंटेलेक्ट एंड द सेम आर्ग्यूमेंट्स अप्लाई हियर imagine all the things that you understood or did not understand when you were in say grade 5 so many things you did not know did not understand about yourself and the world so many things that you understood when you came to grade 10 or you came to college now so the sheet of the intellect has changed so much it has so much knowledge so much understanding so much maturity the sheet of the intellect is different is changing and you have experienced it you are the one who experienced it you are the passenger in the back seat of the car you are not the driver the one with the hands on the wheel is the intellect the understanding faculty the one who is riding the elephant the one who is the charioteer buddhi it is the sheet of the intellect we are going deeper now we are not the sheet of the intellect because the sheet of the intellect changes it's subject to change and we don't feel we have changed with it i was the kid who didn't understand so many things i was the teenager impulsive I was the young man or woman I am the middle aged person now and my understanding has changed so much so much that I've learned so much that I've understood sheet of the intellect changes and another reason now you can apply it I am the knower the sheet of the intellect is known my knowledge I understand my knowledge I know my knowledge I am aware of my knowledge when I say e is equal to mc square or 2 plus 2 is 4 um whatever it's an object which i'm aware of very subtle object deep in the mind in the intellect uh, sheet of the intellect but i'm aware of it think about it it's an object i am not that either beyond the sheet of the intellect is there anything more deeper pratyak inward subtler sukshma subtler than that we are on very subtle grounds here none of it is beyond our experience every day we experience even now we are experiencing it we must match what they are saying to our experience i am not the intellect sheet of the intellect vigyana maya kosha either what is deeper well we have a state of experience common to all of us we have that state where we exist but we do not ex- experience the food sheet annamaya the body the life sheet the pranamaya the mind sheet the manomaya the intellect sheet the vigyana where everything is shut down what is that state sleep. deep sleep in deep sleep we cannot say we do not exist we have to say we exist otherwise we would have to say i was awake i went to sleep and dreamt and now i am awake again but we do see that we do say that i was awake i went to sleep and dreamt then i had a period of no dreams deep sleep then i am awake again we claim that deep sleep for ourselves after all whose deep sleep was it yes so many sorry i'm just part of your last lecture because i was pulling off in the part yeah uh, but, uh, how do i know uh, i've experienced in deep misery right now for hmm. example my mind is experiencing deep misery right now how do i know whether to fix my mind by thinking or to fix the environment by turning on the air conditioner Uh-huh. Okay. Now um Krishna would say in Gita the problems of the world heat and cold pleasure and pain they come and go and he says tan titiksha swabharata you forbear do not run after fixing them too much but remember there is a point to be understood here our goal is not to forbear or not to forbear our goal is to realize brahman our goal is enlightenment whatever helps you towards that enlightenment is good whatever hinders you should be fixed now if i cannot fix my mind on god because it's uh, i can't bear it anymore the environment is too cold or too hot then i let me go and fix it and let me get back to what i'm doing but if it's simply a minor matter you know there are people who want 1 degree more or 1 degree less or 2 degrees more or 2 degrees less otherwise they will not be comfortable let me do that after that i'll meditate these people will never meditate something will be the matter or the other right so a certain amount of spiritual fortitude is necessary there are many many things in life which you cannot fix 
there are many many things in life which takes up too much time and energy to fix which would have been better devoted to spiritual practice one of our senior swamis told me of a story that he saw in the himalayas when he was doing austerities meditation alone in the himalayas he saw this young monk very well built healthy face glowing with uh, with with a you can see idealism joy what was he doing by seeing this monk our our swami said i felt this person if he sits down and meditates he will realize god like that he sees so wonderful but what was he doing he was constructing a cave after the cave is ready he will meditate <laughs> running around with a bucket all day long so powerful single handedly removing rocks and putting in um, stuff to make the cave ready it would take him years precious years of good health of the mind ready for spiritual practice you're wasting to make a to make a cave so spiritual fortitude this is called titiksha in viveka chudamani shankaracharya says sahanam sarva dukhanam apratikara purvakam chinta vilap rahitam sa titiksha nigadyate titiksha spiritual fortitude spiritual endurance what does it mean putting up with pain sorrow at what level it could be at any one of the levels of the five sheets physical level at the level of the prana most diseases are at that level it could be at the mental level hopelessness despair humiliation grief it could be at the intellectual level this theory that theory this person i have to disprove that person uh, debate with this person intellectual suffering all these things bear with it sahanam sarva dukhanam apratikara purvakam without trying to remedy the situation but here is a there is a but chinta vilap rahitam without regret if i am regretting it if it's problematic for me it's not letting me do spiritual practice then better fix it i'll give two examples these are young monks whom i dealt with when i was teaching in the trainings in, in belurmat in the monastery one of the young monks he was fired up with the zeal for spiritual endurance so he had a pain in the uh, in the leg uh, near, in his knee i think and he wouldn't get it treated i could see him fidgeting in the classroom i said get it treated no he's putting up with it fortitude and then one day i saw him sitting for meditation we're all are sitting in the lotus posture he's sitting with one leg extended because he can't fold it anymore i so we said what foolishness is this get it treated that's one the another example was this young novice very good person but he has a pain in the stomach and a real pain it's not imaginary it's actually hurting and he tries this treatment that treatment this doctor natural treatment um, going to uh, allopathy and uh, whatever we could provide and whatever he could get hold of and that's what's bothering him you see what thing is even the pain comes and he's now anxious about the pain so he feels now the pain is going to come when the pain is there he's suffering when the pain is not there he's anxious the pain is going to start any time again it's true it happens like that now finally i told him look the pain is there yes it's disturbing your spiritual life yes now you are taking all sorts of remedies for it yes whatever you can think of whatever we can provide all of it is happening right yes still the pain is there yes you have done all that you can we are also doing all that we can yes now leave it to god what more can we do don't think about it anymore yes sometimes the pain will come sometimes it will not come you think about god god has provided you with this body with these experiences take it all in your in your folded hands and offer it at the feet of the mother this is the pain physical mental whatever let me go on with my spiritual practices this will take care of itself either it will go away or it will not go away but i shall do my spiritual practices to the best possible thing i can he did that months later he called me from a different ashram where he was posted and he said i'm completely cured of the pain he's so happy he said i don't feel it anymore it's gone so these are two different cases where unnecessarily one is involved with there's a trick of the mind gets you involved with the five sheets something happening there and you don't think about god or you don't do vedanta vichara the other one is a as a foolish obstinacy i am practicing fortitude 
there was another monk i, I can <laughs> funny stories a uh, very austere one of the most austere persons i've met he wouldn't eat he would serve us all food in, and much more heat than this he would be serving food to all of us and he would make sure we ate and the persons who were serving food he would serve food to all of them then they all would pack up the dining hall would be closed he wouldn't eat he would go back to his room on the way back he would collect grass from the fields and wash it and boil it and eat the grass unbelievable but i saw it he wouldn't sleep at night reducing sleep he made his bed like this don't ever try these things <laughs> he didn't come to a bad end because the grace of god was upon him he put bricks under one side of the bed so the bed was inclined in this way so he wouldn't feel sleepy and one day at deep in the night we heard an almighty crash what happened he he fell fell asleep and he slipped off the bed <laughs> onto the floor but anyhow slowly he came to his senses and he realized it's not necessary now he had a very senior swami who was a very loving swami he knew the boy was good basically uh, and was just trying it out the best way he knew so he had told all of us that i'm sending this boy he's a bit extreme but do love him and take care of him and that's what everybody did and he came out of it so that's an extreme example the balance is necessary whatever takes us to realization deep sleep that is the what we call the causal sheet anandamaya kosha another na- name is the sli- uh, the sheet of bliss blissful sheet anandamaya kosha what we experience in deep sleep what do we experience so, swami we don't experience anything precisely that blankness somebody is experiencing the blankness imagine as kids sometimes you would love to play in the dark room when you are going to sleep you'd pull the blankets over your the comforter you over your head and it would be completely dark inside now when you open your eyes in a certain sense you are seeing the darkness something like that happens when consciousness is aware of the blankness in deep sleep there is no awareness of body there is no awareness of thought i am sleeping if you have that feeling then you are not sleeping hmm. sometimes mothers play these games with little children they are very difficult to put to you know make make them sleep when they are, they don't don't want to sleep they'll st- suddenly start becoming very active jump around i know because i was in charge of the hostel of little kids 10 year olds and uh, especially at bed time they become extra energetic and there was this old swami uh, who said wait i have learned a technique i saw there was a very strict swami who would say i am going to count to 3 by the count of 3 must all be asleep and he would say 1 2 and by the time he said 3 they were all in their beds and huddling in sleep and this senior swami he said i tried it out the old swami is a very good person and the children know that he is a very good person so he said i am going to count to 3 and by the time it's 3 you'll all be asleep on the bed and he said i said 1 and the children said 2 <laughs> they are not going to go to sleep they know who is strict and whom they can defy easily the mother plays a game with the child if the good boy is fast asleep then his right toe will move and the right toe moves a little <laughs> you know he's he's not sleeping and it will be followed by a muffled giggle of course so in deep sleep there is no experience of of being an individual also but that is the experience of nothingness and you are not that you are not that either why not because that also comes and goes that also comes and goes and that's also an object of experience you are the experience we'll talk more about this tomorrow in the tomorrow the talk which will come up this subject of deep sleep but suffice to say because of the same reason that it comes and goes and it's an object you do not come and go and you are the knower because of these two reasons the sheet of bliss the deep sleep state where the intellect also is not functioning that too we are not and the upanishad here comes the fun part the upanishad comes to this point you are not the annamaya kosha the food sheet because it is a composite it is changing and it's an object you are not a composite you are not changing and you are the subject hence you are not the food sheet you are not the sheet of of life the vital sheet pranamaya kosha because it is changing and it's an object of knowledge you are the subject the knower and you are relatively unchanging 
You are not the sheath of the mind either, deeper, inside, subtler, because it's changing and it's an object. Those are, thoughts are objects for you, the subject. And you are relatively unchanging and you are the object, uh, the subject, the knower of that. And you are not the sheath of the intellect, Vijnanamaya Kosha, because it is changing and it's an object, you are unchanging, you are the knower of that, the subject. You are not even the deep sleep state, the Anandamaya Kosha. Even that you are not. The self is not that. Because it is, it comes and goes and it's an object. You do not come and go and you are the subject. Great. Now we, we are waiting. It's like the nesting dolls, the Russian dolls. You have, see, have you seen them? Yeah. You open them, a little one is there. Open that, a little one is there. And we want the final doll to come out. The real self. The consciousness. Brahman. Call it whatever you will. Atman. We are ready now. And the Taiti Upanishad, from where I'm quoting, plays a trick on us. At that point, a stu student is eager. Well, tell me now, what, what lies next beyond the darkness? I remember when I first heard about this from a very old Swami in Deoghar. I was a newcomer. He's telling them, you're not the body, you're not the mind, and so on. And beyond the mind, I said, beyond the mind and intellect, I said, there's a darkness. Beyond, if you try to think about by mind and intellect, it just goes blank. And then he was a sh short man with uh, bright eyes. Uh, he said to me, and he had a stutter, a stammer. He said, that, is, that one, beyond that darkness, that which is watching that darkness, beyond that das darkness, grasp that. Ota ke dharu. Uh, grasp that. You cannot grasp it, but he means that you realize that. I didn't understand what he meant at that time. So beyond the darkness of deep sleep, what is there? That's what we are ready to know now. And the Upanishad keeps quiet. Doesn't say anything. So we are left exactly, yeah, like all of you are. <laughs> After all this, since the morning and you come to this point, you don't say, you are not going to tell us? The Upanishad doesn't say anything. And the reaction of the student is recorded next. The student says, so the self doesn't exist. Brahman doesn't exist. There's nothing. It's like an onion when you peel the onion and there's nothing inside. And Upanishad doesn't answer. What is the meaning of that? The, the, the student says, Asad bhavati. Suppose you think there's no Brahman then. There's no, no Atman, no self. It's the void, empty. And the Upanishad says, then you would not exist. Now what does that mean? For this, I have to tell a story. And Shankaracharya also tells this story, and it's an old story in non-dual Vedanta. The point of this story, at the end of it, I'll expect you to understand the point, minimum. That's pass marks. <laughs> and if you can intuitively feel what they're talking about, then you'll walk out enlightened. <laughs> yes, the story goes like this. Ten friends cross a river. And when they cross a river, after crossing the river, they say, did, did we all swim across? Did we all walk across? Because uh, um, somebody might have drowned. Are there 10 of us now? Let's count. And they count. One of them makes the others line up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wait, 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 something wrong. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh my God. Today they would say OMG <laughs> in the <laughs> mobile. Oh my God. One of us has drowned. And he sits down with his hand on his uh, head and others are saying, what do you mean one of us don't? You count for yourself. There are only nine of us. There were ten of us when we started out. And the other person counts. He gets nine. Each one of them counts. They get nine. And they sit down and start wailing. And inevitably a wise person walks past. What's, the, what's wrong? Well, our friend has died. He's drowned. How did that happen? Well, there were ten of us. And we crossed and we counted. And we find only nine. The tenth person has drowned. And that wise man, he counts and he sees there are ten. And he says, well, don't cry, trust me, the tenth person is there. The wise person, the guru comes and tells us, there is a way out of the sorrow of human existence. Call it Brahman or God or Atman or Nirvana or whatever you call it. Enlightenment, whatever you call it, it exists. 
But the first thing he says is, trust me, I'll show it to you. But first, calm down. It's essential, you must calm yourself, calm down. So they believed him. They believed him. And then they said, not just blind belief, show us. There is the tenth person. He said, all right, line up. He asked one of them, you count. I have counted, trust me, count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this person comes and holds that person's hand and turns it around. Dashamas tuamasi, thou art, thou art the tenth. Thou art the tenth. And this person goes, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, the tenth person is there, we have, I found him. The others say, let me try it, let me try it. And they try one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We may laugh, but that's the tragedy of our lives. We are missing the tenth. Watch, watch what's happening. Keep the five sheets firmly in your mind. Know that you are not these five sheets. Okay? You are looking for yourself, you are the tenth person, or in this case, the sixth person. You say, I am not this one, physical sheet. I am not the inner one, the life sheet. I am not the inner one, the mental sheet. I am not the inner one, the intellectual sheet. I am not the inner one, the sheet of darkness, of, of bliss, deep sleep. The next step has to be, I am that. That turning is an intuitive turning which no teacher can accomplish for you. That, that turning. You, what you have to do is, you move in your experience. You sit down, close your eyes, feel the body. Here is the hand, hand, the sheet of food, Annamaya Kosha. The energy with which I move the hand, Pranamaya Kosha. The thought about moving the hand, Manomaya Kosha. The decision, I am moving the hand, Vijnanamaya Kosha. The pleasure or otherwise of moving the hand, sort of extending it to Anandamaya Kosha. I am none of these. Go deeper. This I am not. The energy flowing through this body I am not. The thoughts which are coming I am not. The understanding which I am using now I am not. The blankness beyond that I am not. <coughs> then that turn inwards. I am. See, you are not an object. What was the problem of the tenth person? Why could he not find the tenth person? He was looking for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He will never find the tenth person in that way. He will never find the tenth person in the way he found the nine persons. Because they are objects. He is the subject. You will never find the inner self by trying to look for one more thing beyond the darkness of deep sleep. It's not an object. It is the subject which watches all five sheets. It's as much present here in the physical body as it watches the, psych the, the um, vital body, as it watches the uh, mental body, as it watches the intellectual body, as it watches the deep sleep body, the sheets. It equally illumines all five. It's not a thing, not one more little Russian doll within the last Russian doll, nested doll. It's not that. Right? It, it, is in all, it is the witness of all five sheets. It's you, yourself, not a thing. That's the furthest one can go. Shankaracharya in, in the Aitariya Upanishad commentary, he uses a very nice story to illustrate at this point what happens. He, the story is like this. A man was scolded by his guru. The guru said, Amanushyatvam, you are not human. Today they would say, you're not a man. You're not human. And he felt very bad. He sat there feeling sad and depressed. Till a, a friend came along and said, why are you depressed? Oh, I'm not a human. Um, who told you that? My guru. He was scolding me. Well, he was just scolding you, just to put you on the right track. It's not that you're not human. No, I'm not a human. Well, let's see. Now, watch, the, watch what the friend does. The friend tells him, it's all in the story. The friend tells him, Let's look at the set of non-humans. You're not a human, so you're a non-human. Let's look at the set of non-humans. 
Stocks and stones. Non-human? Yeah. Are you a stock or a stone? No. Plants and trees. Non-human? Yes. Are you a plant or a tree? No. Animals, creepy crawlies. Not human? Yes. Are you a, one of those crawling things, insects? No. Higher animals, non-human. Are you one of the higher animals, or a dog or a cat or a, um, or a monkey? No. So the entire set of non-humans, the set of non-humans, you have exhausted, you are none of them. Therefore, now Shankaracharya says, if that man says, I have understood that I am not a non-human, but what am I then? If he says that, nobody can help him. He should come to the conclusion, I am not any of the non-humans, so I am human. That's only, the entire universe divides into two sets, human, non-human, A and not A, pure mathematics, set theory. If you have denied the non-human, you must be human, or else you must be non-existent. But you know that you exist, so you must be human. In the same way, if you deny every possible object, only two things remain before you. Either you do not exist, but you cannot doubt that you do not exist. You exist. Then what are you? You are the subject. The subject is never an object. The moment you grasp the subject as subject, the moment you grasp the witness as really, really the witness, not a bit of the witnessed, as you grasp consciousness as pure consciousness, you tend to fall silent. Because words are always in the realm of objects. Sri Ramakrishna says, you cannot put it in words. You cannot express it in words. Why you cannot express it in words? And then what, do the, what does the Vedanta do? The Vedanta expresses what cannot be expressed in words. It expresses through words. How does it do that? Well, that's the subject for tomorrow's talk in Boston. Language of paradox in Advaita Vedanta. How, how does the Vedanta, the Upanishads, express in words what cannot be expressed in words? That's why they come to this point and leave you at this point. Now, at this point, one must first understand what they mean, which direction they are pointing at. And if possible, by the grace of God, you once grasp that, you realize everything else, the five sheets, you are not the five sheets, they, are not, they don't belong to you. They are in the realm of the object. You are the pure subject. You are the sun of light shining upon the rocks which are planets and moons and asteroids. They are not part of the sun. They are absolutely not affected by the sun. By the, by the sun is not affected by them. In a solar system, in the same way, the five sheets, they are like orbits around you, the central core of consciousness. You shine upon them. They are objects. They are not really associated with you. They come and go at the will of God, not your own. The, the, the proof is that one, we cannot prolong our life by one instant if we would, even if you want it. New Testament, I'm quoting the New Testament to you. Who, Sermon on the Mount, who could but prolong his life for one instant, not Sermon on the Mount, uh, who could prolong his life for even one instant uh, beyond his natural life? They are not at our beck and uh, command. So you are the consciousness shining upon nature. This is one step in Advaita. There is a further step, but we will not go into that. So you are the pure consciousness. Then only you can say what you were singing earlier. Chidananda Rupaha Shivoham Shivoham. Chidananda Rupaha Shivoham Shivoham. I am existence consciousness bliss. I am Shiva. I am Shiva. But before that, you have shifted the I. We have shifted the I from the body and the physical, uh, this, this um, vital sheet, the mental sheet, the intellectual sheet, the blankness, beyond that to the pure subject. We have driven the I back there. Have you become less thereby? No. The body is still there. Even when you realize that the body will still continue to function as it, the mind will still continue to function. Life will last as long as God wants it to last. But you are free of it now. You can continue to function in that. But you are free of it. You are not trapped it in it any, anymore. You don't feel that when it goes, I, have, I am gone too. Mm. Yeah, there's a question. So, mm, I can wrap my head around the idea of consciousness being separate from the five sheets. But where does, where does 
Okay. Yes. Now in Taitiri Upanishad, normally they first talk about existence and consciousness. So right now you can understand that pure consciousness, which is the pure subject, not an object, definitely exists and definitely it must be conscious because it illumines everything else. By its light, everything is illumined. After, after talking about this, Yama tells Nachiketa, one of the most famous mantras in all of Upanishadic literature, one of Swami Vivekananda's favorites, and which, if you ever come for the prayer in the evening, you have repeated so many times year after year without knowing it. When you isolate, when you understand yourself as the pure consciousness, as the sun of consciousness, shining from the innermost core, illumining the five sheets, and through the five sheets illumining the whole world. That pure consciousness, Yama tells Nachiketa, one of the most beautiful verses, uh, mantras. Natatra Suryo Bhati Na Chandra Tarakam Nema Vidyuto Bhanti Kutoya Magni Tameva Bhantam Anubhati Sarvam Tasya Bhasa Sarvam Idam Vibhati Where? In your true nature. In the self, the sun does not shine. Neither the moon nor the stars. The lightning does not flash there. No material light can illumine that. So what to speak of this mortal fire? In those days at night, fire. That cannot illumine the true self which you are. Rather, by its light, all these are illumined. All our mortal lights and natural lights are illumined by the light of the self which you are. After all, the light reveals this hall. But what reveals the light? Your consciousness. Tameva bhantam manubhati sarvam. Consciousness shining, all of these shine forth. You shining, all of these shine forth. Tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. By its light, the universe is lit up. By your light. Say, oh, by the light of my true nature, by true self. Don't say my true self. It's speaking about it like my kidney or my liver. You say boldly, it's by my light the universe is lit up. So, no, only when we realize it. Not only when you realize it right now, even when you do not realize it. After all, with what are you experiencing the world? Consciousness. That's exactly what they are talking about. Only when we do not realize consciousness as it is, we find it mixed up with mind and body and that's what we call ourselves. Mr. So-and-so or Swami so-and-so. When we realize the consciousness as it is, the passenger as it is, in its own glory, then we say, I am pure consciousness, the light of the universe. When you sing in the hymn in the evening, a little while later we'll do it, Sri Ramakrishna's hymn, there you will find, Jyoti Ra Jyoti, the light of the lights. We think, it, it's meant for Sri Ramakrishna. We sing to the Lord, you are the light of the lights. Vedanta tells you, that light of the lights is you. The hymn says it, where is this light of the lights? You say, why up there? He's sitting there. No, what are you singing? Which, which lights up the darkness of the heart. The light of the lights is within you. It is you. You are the light of lights. Ujala Ridikandara, which shines in your heart. And heart means, Shankaracharya explains always heart in spiritual, in Vedanta means the, the mind. The consciousness which shines, buddhi guha, the cave of the intellect, the consciousness which shines there. That is who you are, the, the um, light of lights shining within. Now, bliss. You see, um, they say that uh, bhuma vai sukham. Nalpe Sukhamasti in Chandogya Upanishad, the infinite alone is true bliss. We find true bliss only in the infinite and in full freedom. Limited bliss, limited happiness is what comes and goes. Even that is a particle of that infinite happiness which is within us. So that happiness which is within us, this pure consciousness, that is experienced in the mind as happiness. That's why it is called pure consciousness or pure bliss. When it's experienced in the mind, it's a feeling of happiness. Swami Vivekananda puts it this way. Look at the existence, consciousness, bliss. That's supposed to be the true self. Now, Swami Vivekananda says, not that it exists, but it is existence itself. 
not that it is it knows anything it's a knowledge itself not that it is happy it is happiness itself if you try to understand what is existence what is consciousness then you'll understand what is bliss also you see the consciousness which we experience here is pure consciousness plus mind right now the hap- the existence that we experience here is pure existence brahman plus these names and forms bottle exists table exists man exists woman exists names and forms bottle table man and form are name and form exists 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 in itself brahman existence itself but it's not a thing brahman is not a thing which exists consciousness which we just studied it now consciousness is not an object it is that which is aware of objects similarly bliss is not a happy feeling it's not an unhappy feeling either it's not a feeling it that that which gives rise to joy that is bliss i know it won't be absolute all that clear there that's why the taitiriya upanishad has an entire section but that's it's called ananda mimamsa um but for that i'll have to come back again thank you very much thank you thank you that was a superb exposition of a very difficult and subtle topic and i hope that we have taken enough material out of these three classes as we say uh, that it is an attempt and attempt then very successfully uh, to compress the ocean Uh, into a quart jar you say uh, the three classes how can he tell but how much but uh, he has given such important points throughout and he has taken the questions also uh, in the stride as they were spontaneously presented of course there will be the question answer class uh, later on after we again had a little tea break uh and then but he finished 2 minutes before yes, yes. one thing i wanted to say if i could after you finish one uh okay so <laughs> many 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 thanks for coming here sarvapriyanand ji and giving us this uh, beautiful discourse this kathopanishad retreat and kathopanishad is uh, this he was describing that it is inner journey and then it reaches the destination he has actually uh, summarized only the first chapter of kathopanishad uh, you have to come not only for that discussion but for second chapter of kathopanishad too so it is the first chapter of kathopanishad kind of ends that yes this whatever was being given by the lord of death mrityu prokta nachiketoth labdha that what was being given by uh, uh, this lord of death absorbed by nachiketa internalized it and took up the journey he gave, lord of death gave the direction he told gave the map and then the aspirant has to walk on the path so nachiketa took it up and what happened that he realized it that he became virajo abhud vimrityu that yes brahma prapto virajo abhud vimrityu that he realized his oneness it is difficult to describe i am interested how he is going to describe it tomorrow at boston how uh, these how the indescribable is being described brahm prapto virajo abhud vimrityu and then comes a master stroke that it is not only limited to nachiketa this is a science this is the efficacy of knowledge anyone anyopyevam yo vidadhyatmam eva anybody else who realizes this this fact 
will also become like Nachiketa Brahman. It is not monopoly here. It is the knowledge, just as anybody uh, knowing how to get here can come here. You have the GPS or whatever, follow the directions, everybody can come here. So also this is the map given, anybody who gets this and walks the path has to come to this realization. This is the great beauty of it. So let us hope, let us be sure and in fact this is the only thing that we can be sure of realizing our true self. Because it is our true self, what else can be sure of uh, more than that? So this is surely going to happen to us the moment we start our journey. Yes. So let us hope that we start this journey and reach the destination right in this human birth. Thank you again to Sarva Priyananji. Uh, thank you, friends, for uh, so far attending this retreat. Of course, it is not over. There are many pro other programs, uh, but the first program is to take a break for snacks, uh, tea, coffee, etc. And then we will assemble again for the question and answer session, and which usually, uh, and I am sure this time too, uh, is more illuminating and interesting than just uh, the discourse. So you can see if the discourses were so illuminating, uh, how much more the question answers will be. So get ready for that and uh, try to fill the uh, bucket of questions. Maybe there are, how many are there Quran? Not many, okay. So, okay, so by while you are, huh? Eight. Eight. Oh, okay. Mm, so, let's see, they are a big number, but you can add a few more. Okay. Just one point I promised to mention the takeaways from the three talks. Yeah. So, just remember, you already have written it down. Remember the power of choice from the first talk. Remember the chariot example. What, what the chariot is, what the horses are, what the reins are, what the driver is, and, what the, and you are the passenger. The chariot example. And in the third one, remember the story of the ten people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We will take it up in question and answers afterwards.